And are, are you a believer in, in the value of zone two or not really? I absolutely avoid it like the plague. I think it's a very, very bad idea long term for a person's health prospect long based on my understanding of exercise physiology i can tell you that most of what you hear from exercise physiologists about the so-called need for this zone to volume training is totally false absolutely unscientific it's based on fundamentally flawed models of how exercise energetics cellular energetics muscle energetics even works it's fascinating but that's probably that's probably a discussion for another day because that's a whole discussion all by itself yeah, but now I'm I'm tempted because now you're you're suggesting changes to my own workout, so I'm tempted to push you a little bit on this if you don't mind. Sure, you can absolutely. So what I'm, you know, the way that I do things and it, it's working well for me so far, but maybe I should tweak it is that I go to the gym three to four times a week. I do something like what you're suggesting. So the weights is going to be full body training, mm. reps to failure as much as I can. Mm. But in the beginning, I do thirty minutes of zone two. Mm. When I first started that, it seemed to seemed to make me just fitter overall. What I do now is after the zone two, I also do some sprints. Mm. Definitely do like a good five, six sets of sprints and, and then I'm done. Mm. And sprints are, you know, 100% like as, as fast as I can possibly go. So we're talking between 20 and 30 seconds, not more than that. Right. Cool. And then walking to, you know, walk. So I'll, I'll sprint for 30 seconds. I'll walk for a minute and a half, that kind of thing. Okay. But you're saying I, I may be able to maximize things just by maybe stretching and not doing the zone two stuff. The way I approach training when I'm doing training, I would start with five minutes maximum of zone two so-called work. And that's purely just to warm my body, to put some heat through the muscles and get them ready to become more elastic and less plastic so that the risk of me injuring myself when I'm doing my high intensity workout is lowered, so-called. So... I'm going to choose something like, because I'm doing a whole body split, I'm going to choose something like the concept rowing erg or something like that as my warm-up kit. So I'm going to jump on there and I'm going to do five minutes of rowing at the middle upper end of the zone two training. So I want to get some heat through my muscles. I want to get a bead of sweat on. I want to raise my heart rate and respiratory rate to get me ready for the activity. That's my warm-up per se. In terms of stretching, not a fan depending on activity, etc., and required ranges of motion, power output, concerns, all of that. But in general, for most people, for most purposes, stretching is not only not helpful, it actually seems to be a bad idea. So I'm not going to be doing stretching per se. What I am going to do is I'm going to select, if I'm doing weights, I'm going to select a weight that's around about 50% of my 1RM, and I'm going to lift that 15 or 20 times with perfect form making sure that I'm focused on the feeling in the joint, the feeling in my segments, the kinesthetic feedback, making sure, and using mirrors as well, making sure that my form is spot on. Then I'm going to rack that weight straight away and do my first working set. So I'm going to go straight to the heaviest weight I can lift eight times from that 50%. So there's a big jump there. I've already worked through the range of motion. My muscles are warm. The risk of injury is not going to be decreased by me having done some stretching. In fact, the risk of injury might actually be increased by me having done that. So straight to that heavy weight, eight reps, rack that weight, because I'm not going to do the second set at that stage. And then I'm going to go and get my 50% weight for my second exercise, do that, do the first working set. Then to the top of my list, second working set, straight away, straight back to the same weight again. No warm-up set the second time around. Done. In and out of the gym, if I'm doing it in the gym. I mean, I also do a lot of stuff around the house here with really very, very basic equipment. My own body mass, my weight, one or two free weights, mostly dumbbells, a bunch of different elastic band modalities, including the X3, which is a great bit of kit in terms of um, it does what it says it does when used in the right way, etc. I think it's something that could be in people's home exercise gear. It, there is one here in the house, and I found it useful in a number of ways, etc. I've also got a bunch of other elastic band things that aren't X3 or X3 generated things as well. So I've been using variable resistance for some time as a, as a as a training methodology. So what I'm hearing is that um, for my sins, I still listen to Dr. Peter Atia, yep. who puts a, put a, puts a big emphasis on zone two training. And what I'm hearing is that based on your reading of the science, that's completely unnecessary. Peter is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I'd, and and let me clarify that because it's a big thing to say somebody else is wrong. Let me, so let me justify it a bit. There are many different ways to skin a cat. What we are interested in here is the outcome. 
when you're doing physical training, what we are looking at at the end of it, the reason we are doing it is because we want a specific physiological capacity as the outcome, a specific form of fitness. People are often asking me, what should I do for general fitness? There is no such thing. General fitness is a construct, it's an idea and it's a fallacy. All fitness capacities are explicitly and very definitely specific to task. Am I saying there's no bleed across? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that if you're training for a specific event, the best way to train for that event is at the intensity that would be required of you on a competition day. The idea that you need to do miles and miles and miles, hours and hours and hours of so-called training at an intensity well below your competitive intensity and at, at a volume and duration far longer than your event, absolutely ridiculous and false. The only thing that I've heard people say as an argument supporting it that has any basis in even what you would consider to be common sense would be they say, oh yes, but a lot of zone two training is involved in helping you build higher numbers of mitochondria and larger mitochondria, allowing your oxidative capacity to be better, which is great until you understand that that is a specific physiological response to a specific training pattern. That is your body getting used to running hours and hours and hours, miles and miles and miles at a lower intensity or a relatively low intensity to your maximum. Now, we know there's a relationship between the time over which you can endure an event and the workload at which you are working at that time. So the harder you work, the sooner it will cave you in. Goodness me, that's shocking, isn't it? I bet you've never thought of that before. It's this whole adage of as you train, so shall you perform. If your training is long and slow, guess what's going to happen on race day? Well, if it's a, if it's a marathon, you might do well. Well, not really, because a marathon is long and fast, actually. I mean, when you look at the speed across the ground of elite marathon runners, let's look at the world record. You know, he, he's running at something like 22 kilometers an hour. Now, anyone that doesn't know what that is, go to a gym somewhere that's got a treadmill that goes up to 22 kilometers an hour, set it to 22, and away you go. See how long you last. What we have there is an extreme efficiency of movement an idealized body composition for that event as a result of that person's training. And let's face it, it's a generous hand in terms of the genetics involved. Just to sort sort of to get to the, the punchline of this discussion, mm. I had a slide which maybe I'll put in the, the thumbnail of this video or something, or I'll put it on the on, in the in the comments, which showed the difference between the physiology between a long distance sort of an ultra marathon runner and a sprinter. And in general, most people, so if you're if you're Competing in marathons or ultra marathons, it's a different story, but most people want to look like the sprinter and not the marathon runner. Yeah. And the marathon runner has a fair bit of intramuscular fat, which is actually, it's a useful adaptation for that particular yeah. purpose. Yeah. We also know from people like Professor Tim Noakes mm. that they are also, they can develop diabetes, they can develop heart issues and so on at a pretty bad pace because intramuscular fat are those ad adaptations for the long distance running. And so the point is that for most of us who want to lose fat, for most of us who want to optimize muscle, you want to train more like the sprinter than the marathon runner. Have I, am I, am I on the same track as you are? Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. And in, in terms of what's most likely to be of utility in everyday life for a human being living in a Western society, high intensity burst repeat activity is far more likely to be useful to you than the ability to run a marathon. There's no use for that in everyday life. The only reason that you would ever train to run marathons is if you want to run a marathon. You wouldn't You wouldn't say, I'm going to train for a marathon for my general fitness, because there ain't no such thing, as I said. It's a specific training ability. And of course, it turns out that training at an intensity well above the zone two, the idealized training zone for cardiovascular effect, it turns out the training above that also elicits the same adaptations or very similar ones. So... The argument for it evaporates even before you look at why the model is completely wrong in the first place. Yeah. In retrospect, I think, you know, looking at my own journey, I think zone two training was probably helpful to get me from like sedentary doing something like it played an actual role. But now that I can do stuff, I probably like it probably not doing anything for me. I could probably just go to the straight to the lifting weights and sprinting and get the same kind of effect is what I'm hearing from you. Yeah. And let's say you want to have a baseline ability to, let's say you're a jogger, 
for your main training modality. And let's say you want to be able to jog 5Ks as your minimum fitness for running capacity for some reason, then all you need to do to maintain your ability to run 5Ks is once a week run 5Ks. Not 6Ks, not 10Ks, not 15, 5. But do that as fast as you can every single time you do it. And that will maintain your ability to do that. If you are a 10,000 meter specialist competing at 10,000 meters level, then you better train that. Then that's where you should train. You should train at a speed that you can maintain for 10K, i.e. your competitive speed. Or you should train by running faster than that, which will cave you in quicker than 10 Ks is up, necessarily. But you should never, ever, ever train below that intensity because, well, for a bunch of reasons, but one in particular is that the speed of running is very, very important in your brain deciding which motor units to select, which muscle fibers to select to do the running movement, the cyclic activity of running. When you train a motor unit, any one given motor unit, by means of training your body as a whole, when you train that motor unit to be active at a lower power output speed across the ground in the case of running, the reason that happens is because that, those muscle fibers physically, morphologically, and biochemically actually change. They are trainable. So what I'm saying is a fiber which tends to be at the glycolytic end of the spectrum, which would be a bigger fiber, a more powerful fiber, a, a more quickly fatiguing fiber, necessarily because of the differences in muscle fiber morphology and stuff. Sorry, forgive me if I get the terminology right, but type 2B? Yeah, there, there, are, there are touted to be three different muscle fiber types. These are just categories. This is not that there are three different muscle fiber types and never the twain shall meet. This is a continuum, and the muscle fiber types are just a means of grossly morphologically describing the differences between the muscle fibers. Any muscle fiber existing anywhere on that spectrum can be trained to actually become smaller, less powerful, more fatigue resistant, or larger, more powerful, more quickly fatiguing. So if you train at 60% of your competitive intensity, two things are gonna happen. Number one, your physiology will be optimized for running at that speed, which is absolutely useless to you on race day, because you need to run 100% of your competitive intensity to win, if you have any chance of winning in the first place. And secondly, your muscle morphology will move that way to support that. So you won't, yeah. you won't have optimal performance. The other thing that also happens is all of that training is a cumulative fatigue burden, which just breaks the body down and prevents sufficient recovery time for you to optimize your training response.